So turn to Exodus 27. Uh, once again, we're looking at the tabernacle, the tent of God, uh, where God would meet with His people. And as we've seen, everything in the tabernacle is a picture of heaven. Uh, the Lord is giving Moses very specific instructions about how everything is to be made. And God is adamant that Moses must follow the pattern exactly as God gives it to him. And God would only manifest himself to the people if they followed his instructions completely. And that was not only about building the tabernacle the way God told him, but it also they had to do all the sacrificial uh, offerings. They had to properly apply the sacrifices in their worship of God. So if they did not follow God's instructions exactly, then they were in big trouble with God. And the, and the easy example to point out is with Nadab and Abihu. They were sons of Aaron, and because they offered strange or profane fire upon the altar, God struck them down. And so we've also seen everything, <clears throat> everything about the tabernacle points to the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. He has fulfilled all the requirements of God in order for sinful people to be forgiven and cleansed of all of their sins and now enables us to come into His very presence. <coughs> Excuse me. So even as God had specific instructions for the Israelites how they were to approach God, God has given us very specific instructions how we are to approach God today, and it's through faith alone in Christ alone. Bottom line, you know, we cannot come to God and on our terms, but it has to be the way God instructs us. And so, there's no other way to come into His presence except through the salvation He offers in Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. One way to heaven, one way into the presence of God, it's through Jesus Christ alone. Not through a religion, not through any kind of you know, gimmick, uh, pressure, you can't earn your way, you, can't, you don't deserve heaven, but it's only through Jesus. Peter says of Jesus, Acts 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul says in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So we have access into the throne room of God's grace, and it's through Jesus, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so again, the whole thing, it's all about Jesus. So far, God has given Moses instructions about uh, the making of the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat that goes on top of it. You can put that picture up of the cutaway and so the tabernacle on the far left, you see that's the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. And you have the veil there. But it was only once a year that, uh, and that was the most important article in the tabernacle. Once a year the high priest would go in there with the blood of a bull, blood of a goat, blood of a lamb, sprinkle it on there. And that was for uh, the sins of the people, the nation of Israel. Only once a year, and it was a temporary covering for their sins. Well, we see how all this points to Jesus, and Jesus is a final high priest. He passed through the veil, and uh, he offered up his own blood on the mercy seat once and for all. In fact, as we saw last time, as Jesus was dying on the cross, the temple veil there in Jerusalem was torn from top to bottom by God himself. In other words, everybody can now have access to God the Father. But you can only come to God the Father if you are born again by God the Son. You have to be saved. We've also looked at the table of showbread that's kind of directly on the other side. You don't really see it from the menorah. That's where they would have 12 loaves of bread on the table of showbread. It was signifying that God would provide for His people, the 12 tribes of Israel. Every week they'd put new bread on there. The old bread would be eaten by the priests. And then they would continually recognize that God will provide for us. The obvious connection to Jesus, He is the bread of life. Uh, he offered up Himself once and for all. And so whoever comes to Jesus will never hunger again spiritually because He has given us His life. He's given us eternal life. And then we saw the gold lampstand, which you can kind of see there just to the right of the priest there. 
That's also known as the menorah. It was uh, an oil lamp, seven receptacles on it, and it was the only source of light within the tabernacle. And again, it had to be kept burning continuously, and Jesus is the light of the world. Um, in him is truth, and there, in him is no darkness at all. And so as we pick up in chapter 27, we're going to look at the altar of burnt offering. And this was the biggest piece of furniture as it pertained to the tabernacle. Um, as with all the furnishings, this was extremely important as it pertained to worshiping God. And we will definitely see this points to Jesus. Jesus fulfills the altar of sacrifice. So look at chapter 27, starting in verse 1. He says, You shall make an altar of acacia wood five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. So you can go ahead and put that picture up there of the altar. And this is a pretty good representation of it. Um, it's basically seven and a half feet square. So when you remember a cubit is 18 inches. So anytime you see something like five cubits, just add half of five, two and a half. So it's seven and a half feet square, four and a half feet tall. And then you see the four horns on each corner. It was the, the biggest item. And it was the very first thing you see when you came through uh, the, the outside entrance. Uh, we'll look at that later, 30 feet wide. You come through there, and that's the first thing you would see is this big altar. And um, again, this was uh, very big for a reason, and each corner of the horns on the altar were where they would tie up the sacrificial animal because they would slaughter the animal. They'd take blood. They'd put it on each of the four horns of that altar, and then they would pour blood around it, and then if it was on the Day of Atonement, they would take some of that blood inside into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on the uh, mercy seat. Now, inside the tabernacle, we've, we've seen that every item was overlaid with pure gold. All the acacia wood was overlaid with pure gold, representing the deity of Christ. But this is all overlaid with bronze. And you'll see that word bronze used quite a bit. When you read of bronze in the Old Testament, it's always a picture of God's judgment. God's judgment for sin. That's what this represents. The basic meaning of the word altar simply means a killing place. And this was certainly a killing place. This is where the animal would be slaughtered, his blood would be shed, it would be consumed by fire. Now, some of the various sacrifices like the burn offering they would lay the animal on top of that and they would burn it up completely it would be consumed totally by fire other sacrifices like the peace offering they would basically barbecue it and the priests would be able to eat from it they'd still pour out the blood and so forth but they were able to eat uh, the the animal afterwards so different sacrifices for different sins but it was on this altar that the animals would be killed as a substitute and that's the key. It was a substitute for the sins of the people. And starting with this altar, all the way to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, it covers about a 1,500-year period. Millions, literally millions of animals were slaughtered on this altar over the years. I mean, they were slaughtering animals every morning, every evening. That was just what they had to do, plus all the other sacrifices everybody were, was to bring here. And so it was definitely the killing place. Um, and, and again, it was on this altar of brass, bronze, some call it the brazen altar. And they all spoke to the fact that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, there's no remission of sin. Uh, again, the priest could not enter the tabernacle unless they first came to this altar. So even in their daily duties, the priest would have to sacrifice on here, pour out the blood, and then they would wash in the basin. You can kind of see the basin just to the left of the altar there. And then they could go inside and do their priestly duties in the holy place. Not the holy of holies, but the holy place. So it was a lot of blood that was shed. And so these were a constant reminder that the sinful people could not come into God's presence 
on their own merit. Their sin had to be dealt with every single day. So an innocent animal had to be sacrificed any time the priest entered the tabernacle. And so this was a very bloody sacrificial system that God required. I've joked about it in the past, but if PETA was around back then, their minds would be blown because they were sacrificing millions of animals all the time upon these, this altar. Again, that's the only way you could come to God, on His terms. Not on your terms, not on my terms, only on God's terms. And God required blood to be shed and sacrifices to be offered upon the bronze altar. That was the only way the sins of the nation of Israel would be dealt with. And so they were always talking about sin. They were always dealing with sin. They were always talking about the right way to come to God. So again, how does a bronze altar speak to us of Jesus? Well, Jesus is the fulfillment of the bronze altar. Literally, his cross is the fulfillment of the bronze altar. Let me give you a couple of comparisons. Just as the altar was outside in the courtyard, Jesus was taken outside the city walls when he was crucified. Just as the Israelites could not enter into God's presence without first going to the altar, nobody today can enter into the presence of God unless they have gone to the cross, unless they are uh, you know, taking the blood applied the blood of Jesus to themselves and been born again. You cannot come to Jesus on your own terms. It has to be through his blood. And just as this bronze altar signifies God's judgment upon those innocent animals, the cross of Christ is where the Father poured out his wrath, his judgment upon each one of us. He poured it on Jesus in our place. The altar of the cross fulfills everything we read about this altar. John the Baptist proclaimed when he saw Jesus, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And then on the altar, the altar of the cross, at 3, 3 p.m. Um, on Passover, Jesus being crucified, he would cry this out, Matthew 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, again, three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, it was at, at that very moment that all the wrath and judgment you and I deserve for our sins, God was pouring it upon his son as he hung on that altar. He absorbed the penalty and the punishment for all of our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it like this, For he, that's the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, I mean, he was perfect in every way, sinless Lamb of God, he who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, this is why the message of the altar and the message of the cross is so important. The sacrifice had to be made. The blood had to be shed. And the offering had to be burned up on the altar. But at the same time, what a beautiful aroma this altar put off every time an animal was sacrificed. You guys like barbecue? Uh, that's what it was. Every time they would put an animal, it smelled like a barbecue. You know, in the summertime especially, you come driving home, your window's on your car down, and Oh, one of the neighbors is cooking flesh on the barbecue. I mean, it smells so good. You can always smell it a mile away. Well, that's how it was constantly. It was a sweet smell that would come from the burning of the sacrifice. The same is true for Jesus. Ephesians 5, verse 2 says it like this. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. That's where he laid down his life on the cross for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. In other words, that's the smell of salvation. That's the smell of God's forgiveness that is offered to you and me through the sacrifice of Jesus on the altar of the cross. That's the most wonderful thing about the altar of Jesus compared to the bronze altar. Again, whereas millions of animals were sacrificed, Hebrews 10.4 reminds us, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. 
But the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the shedding of His spotless blood washes us clean of every sin, of every iniquity, of every transgression we have ever committed or will ever commit. Hallelujah. Ephesians 1, seven says, In Him, that's in Jesus, you're either in Him or you're not in Him. You're either a saint or an ain't. So if you're a saint, you're in Christ, if you're born again. So in Christ, we have redemption through His blood. That's the only acceptable payment for our sins, His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ, again, you're in Christ, Jesus, who, were one, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. And when you go through the Bible, you go through all of God's Word, you quickly discover that God has a lot to say about blood. Again, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. How sad that so many, so many churches in America, they don't want to talk about the blood of Christ. They don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about repentance. Those things are so negative. Those things are so offensive. We just want to be a positive church. Why can't we be tolerant of what people are doing and just talk about nice things? We just want to send people home with a smile on their face. Well, if that's your attitude, you're in the wrong church. I'm not going to apologize for sin and talking about blood and talking about repentance. God's Word reminds us over and over again. The reason this is so important is that without an altar, there is no hope. Without a sacrifice, we have no chance of going to heaven. Without Jesus dying a brutal death on the cross and shedding His perfect blood for us, then we are still in our sins and we have zero chance of having eternal life. And we know that His sacrifice was accepted because three days later, after He was buried in the tomb, He rose from the dead. And, and that's why it's so important. Without the sacrifice, there would be no resurrection. He had to die and shed His blood for us. Don't ever be ashamed of the blood of Jesus. The first half of the gospel deals with His brutal death on the cross. The second half of the gospel, His glorious resurrection. So don't be ashamed. As Paul says there in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, all of us Gentiles. Never forget, it's at the altar of the cross where we see the greatest example of God's love for us. Um, Romans 5.8 tells us very clearly, but God demonstrates His own love toward us. How do I know God loves me? Because He demonstrated His own love toward you, and that while we, while you were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. He died for me. By going to the cross, that's where we see the greatest demonstration of His love. Look at verse 3. And yes, we will probably make it through. Also you shall make its pans, this is talking about the altar again, to receive its ashes. They must have had a big pile of ashes every day. And its shovels, and its basins, and its forks, and its fire pans, you shall make all its utensils. Notice, again, of bronze. Everything else overlaid with gold inside out here, it's bronze. You shall make a grate for it, a network of bronze. You know, again, this is the big grates of the barbecue. And on the network, you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall put it under the rim of the altar beneath, that the network may be midway up the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, Poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it. You shall make it hollow with boards as it was shown you on the mountain, so they shall make it. So again, we see the altar was portable. Excuse me. It had to be carried. Um, it says here the bronze poles, they were, you know, again, poles made out of acacia wood. They would overlay it with gold or bronze. They'd go in the rings, and they were always to be in there because any time the cloud, the glory cloud moved, they had to wrap everything up, fold it up, carry everything out, follow the cloud, 
until the clouds stopped. Then they'd have to reassemble everything wherever and whenever needed. Now here's something else to consider. Even though Jesus died once for all of our sins, paid the price that we could never pay, he has given each one of us our very own portable cross. Remember? Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and this is whenever and wherever you need to set up your cross to deny yourself, wherever you need to put your flesh to death. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. In other words, for us to have victory over our old nature, we need to reckon our flesh dead whenever it wants to rear its ugly head. We need to crucify our flesh once again. Our flesh, our old nature, is not dead totally. Yes, we've been crucified with Christ, but it's like the way I've heard it explained, it's like your old nature is paralyzed. It's laying in a bed telling you, your, your old nature, you can't do that. God doesn't love you. He doesn't want you around anymore. And you got to reckon that old man dead. He has no power over you except the power of suggestion. And so you need to listen to what God's Word says. Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Very important to realize, we need to die to ourself, deny ourselves, take up the cross daily, follow Jesus. Because we're in this battle. My flesh wants to do this, it wants to go there, it wants to do things that aren't godly. And so we got to reckon that old man dead. we got to say, no, i got to surrender this to the Lord. That's dying to your flesh. Here's the most powerful verse concerning the cross and how it relates to our walk with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That phrase, to us who are being saved, is the sanctification process that every one of us are in. You are complete in Christ. That's your position in Christ. Yes, you've been justified. The moment Christ came into you, you're as saved as you'll ever be. That's your position. When you're glorified and you're out of these bodies of flesh, then we will be without sin. We'll have no temptation of sin. We'll be in our resurrection bodies but that's not until we die and are in the presence of the Lord. Right now, today, we are all in the sanctification process. We're going from glory to greater glory. We are still prone to stumbling and falling, giving in to our sinful nature. And I know many of you, and you've told me many of your stories, so I know it's true. And the same is true for me. We are in process, but praise the Lord. You're not what you used to be. You got saved, and that's a once and for all salvation. You're justified in Christ. I'm looking forward to getting out of these bodies of flesh. Uh, by the way, I just remembered um, thing one. I'm thing two. Thing one just went home to be with Jesus. One of my, Pastor Jeff Johnson, he's one of the original pastors of Calvary Chapel, uh, just died a couple days ago. Calvary Chapel Downey, uh, he'd been there uh, close to 50 years, a pastor there. He resigned, you know, about a year ago. Um, but they were supposed to go to Jerusalem. They were going to minister there, and then he got really sick, and he just went home to be with the Lord. So keep his wife Karen in prayer. First time I met Jeff at a pastor's conference years ago, I said, Jeff Johnson. And he said, yes. I said, Jeff Johnson. He goes, I know. I said, that's me. And he goes, what? And I was like, okay. So I started calling him thing one, and I'm thing two. So anyway, he is in his resurrection body. But we're still in process. We're still going through changes. You know, I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not what I'm going to be. we got a great future ahead for us. Now, it's in the here and now that we're still in this spiritual battle between our flesh and our spirit, and it's because we are still in this sanctification process. It's an ongoing battle, but whenever the old sin nature rears its ugly head, take up your cross, reckon it to be dead, basically that's what Romans 6, 7, and 8 is all about. It's bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We stop listening to Satan's lies when he tells you, and he tells me, 
God doesn't love you anymore. Or you crossed the line again. Or you said something, God can't use you anymore. He doesn't love you anymore. You'll never be whatever. My advice, stop listening to that liar. Start listening to God's word because God tells us, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Jesus says, I'm with you always to the end of this age. My favorite, Philippians 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So in other words, you're not completed yet. We're complete in Christ positionally, but presently we're not finished. Just look in the mirror or pull out some old photographs of yourself. <laughs> wow, look at me 25, 30 years ago. Look at me today. There's a process that's happening here. So we're confident of these things, but hold on to these scriptures. John chapter 7, verse, uh, no, John 10, verse 27. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Praise the Lord. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. What, what more can we say about the bronze altar? that God instructs Moses to make here. Well, actually, there's a lot more to be said about it, but let me just share one more thing before we move on. It's found in the book of Leviticus. This is after everything has been made. God gave Moses the instructions. God put the Spirit upon these artisans. They crafted everything, made everything exactly the way God wanted them to make it. And then the very first thing is they're getting ready to dedicate the tabernacle to the Lord. It was always required, Moses and then Aaron and his sons, they had to slaughter some animals, they had to offer the blood up, they had to cleanse themselves. And then this is what we read in Leviticus chapter 9, starting in verse 22. First, uh, Moses says, Today the Lord will appear to you. Today you will see the glory of the Lord. And then it says, Leviticus 9, 22. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. That was for themselves. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces." I mean, what a sight to behold. This was not some ordinary fire that the priests lit, but it was the holy fire of the Lord. And it was from God. And that was God's sign to Moses and to all the people that they had done exactly what God told them to do. And so God is starting this new work among the people. And by the way, that fire was to never go out. In fact, any time the glory cloud would move, they would take some of those hot coals and they would put them in a censer, and they would go to the next place, and then they would use that to start the kindling and get the fire burning once again. And the incredible thing is, during their nearly 40 years after this, wandering in the wilderness, that fire never went out. And this is a great picture of how the church was born on the day of Pentecost. Just like God sent a supernatural fire upon the altar, that consumed the sacrifice completely, God sent a supernatural fire upon those 120 disciples who were waiting and who were praying in the upper room, just like Jesus told them to. This is what Jesus said just before he ascended up into heaven in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. He tells his disciples, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. That promise is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And that promise again is that they would all be filled up overflowing with the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. The very last thing Jesus said before he ascended back up into heaven, it's recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come notice upon you. The Holy Spirit's already in them. In John chapter 20, before Jesus ascended, you know, long before he ascended, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came into their lives. And now he says, something else is going to happen to you. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. 
That means the Holy Spirit's going to flow out of you like rivers of living water. Not just having the Spirit in you, but He will be working in you and through you. So you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. Witnesses there. The Greek word is martis, where we get the word martyr. You are living martyrs for me because you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to represent me to a lost and dying world. And many of them did die for the Lord. So again, after they waited seven more days, after Jesus ascends up into heaven, and they're wondering, you know, what is the Lord going to do with this? What's going to happen now? We're waiting. We're not sure what's going to happen. This is what we read in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty or rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. That means like a little flame over each one of their heads. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that is when the church was born, on the day of Pentecost, when the fire of the Holy Spirit came upon them and then filled them with God's power. And just as the Israelites experienced that one-time fire coming down from God, the day of Pentecost was in a one-time event when the Holy Spirit came upon them the way He did. But whenever a person comes to Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit also comes into each one of our lives at that very moment of salvation. Now, even though we don't see little tongues of fire dancing over our heads like what happened on the day of Pentecost, you can be assured that when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit did come into your life. He started a supernatural fire within you. It's not a fire you started, but it's a fire that God started. And Jesus said, you were born again from above. Now, even though God started the fire there on the altar in Leviticus 9, the Israelites had a responsibility. And what was that? To stoke the fire, to keep putting more and more wood on that fire, to keep it burning. They had to stoke the fire every day with wood because that fire was to never go out. And again, when the pillar of cloud moved, they would take some of those hot coals, put them in the golden censer, and they would take it with them, then they would start the fire all over again. They would take those coals, blow on it, get that thing roaring once again. And for nearly 40 years, that fire never went out. And in the same way, when Jesus saved us, He started a fire within our hearts. But guess what? We also need to stoke the fire within us. The Holy Spirit within us. He's not going to leave us. That fire is not going to go out, but we also need to stoke the fire daily. How do we do that? By humbling ourselves daily, by coming to God's throne room of grace daily, acknowledging the fact that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Every time when I'm getting ready to get out of bed, usually I'm not even out of bed yet, I was like, Lord, thank you for this new day. Lord, I can't get through this day on my own. I mean, I can do my own thing. I can do whatever I want. I can go to this direction or that. I can just start running around like a chicken with my head cut off. But Lord, I just want to commit this day to you. I pray your Holy Spirit would direct me and lead me. Refill me. Because there's some people I just don't like. And I don't want to see them. So Lord, you got to change my heart. I mean, that's a daily thing. We all need to be refilled moment by moment, day by day. And then, walk, then we ask the Lord to give us the power and strength we need for this day. And as we drink from the fountain of living water, and, and as we feed upon the living Word of God, the fire within us will get hotter, it'll get brighter, and we'll become consumed with the Holy Spirit. And then you start to realize, oh, I guess I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because it's Him strengthening me. It's not me sucking it up. It's not me trying to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. It's denying myself, trusting the Lord that He's going to strengthen me for this day. So it's not like you're getting baptized all over again, but it's being refilled. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But anyway, this is how Paul puts it in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the question I have for you, and I ask myself often, is how is the fire doing in your life today? If you're truly saved, again, the Holy Spirit will always be in your life. The fire will always be there. But if you neglect to stoke the fire, your relationship with Jesus will be more lukewarm. It won't be fire on fire. It won't be hot. It'll be more lukewarm. Warm. Your relationship with Jesus. You won't lose your salvation, but you will not experience the warmth of his love like you should. You may begin to doubt. And how do I know that? Because so many of you told me, I doubt that God loves me. I just did this again. And then you got to remind him again from the word. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Don't, don't doubt these things. Listen to the Lord, what he has to say. You may start sliding back. Some call it backsliding into some of your old sinful habits and desires. And when that happens, you will cause two things to happen in your life with the Holy Spirit. When you start walking in the flesh, you will grieve the Holy Spirit, and you will quench the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what Paul says, Ephesians 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. How do we grieve? Well, read the previous 10 verses and the next 10 verses, and he'll tell you exactly what you as a Christian can do to grieve the Holy Spirit. You have a bitter heart. You have anger towards somebody without a cause. You know, you just start getting caught up in things of the world, and you'll grieve and quench the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul simply says, do not quench the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit in a lot of different ways when we start trusting ourselves instead of relying on the strength of the Holy Spirit. We start depending on ourselves and our own resources instead of going to the Lord daily to receive the resources He wants us to operate in. As Christians, we can easily quench and grieve the Holy Spirit when we neglect to humble ourselves. We start trusting ourselves. We start trusting the words of others. We start trusting the words of our government. Think about that one for a while. We start trusting what they say on Fox News or CNN, and you'll get down. You'll get discouraged. You'll be all bummed out. It's like, oh, I just want out of here. Well, that's the good part. Yeah, we do want out of here. We want Jesus to come for us in, at a moment. Today would be great. But we stop trusting the Word of God. But this I know, God has better plans for our lives. And so if you feel like the fire in you is about to go out. It won't go out because that's the Holy Spirit. He will not leave you or forsake you, but you know, man, there's barely anything burning in my life. There's just not this passion anymore. This is a truth to take note of, Isaiah 42, verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench or extinguish. He will bring forth justice for truth. The smoking flax is a, a reference to the very last piece of wick in an oil lamp. It, it's just about to go out. There's just a little smoldering, you know, little puff of smoke coming out. And God says, you know what? I'm not going to go, Psst. He says, smoking flax I will not extinguish. I will not put out. When God sees a life that is smoldering, when God sees a life that's barely hanging on, He doesn't squelch that. He doesn't crush us out. Instead, if you humble yourself before Him and trust Him with your life, He will once again refill you with oil in the oil lamp. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. He will begin to breathe on you and bring that little tiny spark that's left back into a flame if you will trust Him. Again, Jesus did not come to crush you, to stomp on you, he came, he says, to heal your broken heart, to open up blind eyes, to set at liberty those who are captive, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And that's what he's continuing to do in all of our lives. He came to save those who are lost. Can I get anything else out of the altar? No, not today. Look at verse 9. We'll wrap it up here shortly. 
You shall also make the court of the tabernacle for the south side. There shall be hangings for the court made of fine woven linen, 100 cubits along, uh, long for one side. So they say you can put that picture up of the, the outer court. So you see that's the entrance that he'll mention here in a second. Um, the length, the white curtains, it's 150 feet. The, the east side, the west side are both 75 feet in length. He says here in verse 10, and his 20 pillars and their 20 sockets shall be bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be silver. Likewise, along the length of the north side, there should be hangings 100 cubits long, again, 150 feet, with the 20 pillars and their 20 sockets of bronze and the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver. And along the width of the court on the west side, it should be hangings of 50 cubits, again, 75 feet, and with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. The width of the court on the east side, and that's what you're looking at there, the east side, shall be 50 cubits. The hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. And on the other side, there shall be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen, and that's what you're looking at there, 20 cubits long. So that would be 30 feet. This was the entrance into the courtyard. And it would be woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen, same as the veil inside the temple or the tabernacle, made by a weaver. It shall have four pillars and four sockets. All the pillars around the court shall have bands of silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the width 50 throughout, and the height 5 cubits, made of five woven linen, fine woven linen, and its sockets of bronze, all the utensils of the tabernacle for all its service, all its pegs, all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze, again, for judgment. Now, from the outside, that it's about seven and a half feet high, that fence. So from the outside, you couldn't really see anything inside. The, the people would just see the top of the tabernacle, but they were encouraged to come as close as they could. That's what... Um, Moses said there in Leviticus 9, come close, come around here, as close as you can, because God's going to do something. And that's when he sent fire down upon the altar and consumed the, the burnt offering. But the courtyard, a very important place. When they build the temple, they'll have a couple different courtyards for different people. Courtyard for the Jews, one for the women. There would be a courtyard for the Gentiles later on. And so this is as close as they could get. Look at Psalm 65 verse 4. Check this one out. Psalm 65 verse 4. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. Talking about the courtyard. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. And then there's Psalm uh, 84 verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Even though I can't be in the Holy of Holies, that's what the Jews were thinking, I want to be as close to the Lord as I can get. And God put that within everybody's heart. He wants us to have that desire to draw close to Him. He wants us to have that desire to be in His presence. And He has done everything possible here to have His Jew, Jewish people, the Israelites, come close to Him even though only the high priest could go inside the Holy of Holies. Jesus tears a veil in two. It's open now to all of us, and God still wants people to come into His presence. He created you, He created me for fellowship. He didn't need us. I mean, the angels can do a lot more and a lot faster than anything we could do here, but He created us because He loves us, and He wants us to have fellowship with Him. Unfortunately, too many people try to fulfill that desire to draw near to God by going all kinds of different religions. They worship pagan gods. They get involved in all kinds of weird rituals. God made it simple. You come to me through Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. Look at verse 20. We'll wrap it up. It says, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony. Aaron and his son shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on 
behalf of the children of Israel. Again, we see that the people of Israel needed to stoke the fire of the lampstand, the, the menorah, and they would do that. That was the priest's job. They had to make sure there was oil in the lampstand. They had to make sure the wicks were trimmed and that they were burning. That was a daily thing. Every morning, every evening, it says. And they said, use pure and pressed olive oil for the lampstand. It had to burn at all times. The menorah was refilled every day. Now, as we've already seen, the lampstand is a picture of Jesus, the ultimate light of the world. The oil in the scriptures often represents the Holy Spirit. Don't let the Holy Spirit wane in your life. Keep walking in the fullness of the Spirit every day. And just as Jesus did not begin his earthly ministry until the Holy Spirit came upon him at his baptism, we can't do anything for the Lord unless we're walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit as well. We need to be filled. We need to be refilled by the Holy Spirit. Paul says it like this, Ephesians 5.18, where he reminds us, Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. You can put in there anything. Do not be drunk or wasted, consumed by all the stuff of this world, in which is wastefulness, but be filled with the Spirit. And I always want to point out, in the Greek, it literally says, be being filled. He's writing this to the believers in Ephesus. I want you to keep on being filled. Yes, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's salvation. He came into your life, but I want you to be being filled. Only you and I know for ourselves, are there rivers of living water flowing in me and out of my life? Or am I just a drip? Ask yourself that. I mean, the world knows. That guy's a drip. I'm not seeing Jesus in that person's life. I'm seeing condemnation. I'm seeing rudeness. I'm seeing anger. I'm seeing bitterness. I don't see anything of Jesus in their life. Only you and I know. We, he wants rivers of living water to flow in and out of our lives today. So don't be drunk or consumed by, motivated by this stuff of the world, because it's all wastefulness. But be being filled with the Holy Spirit. This promise to be filled with the Spirit is for us today. Uh, the life group questions that I put together for this week will go into greater detail about this, but how do we know this is true? Because of Acts 2, verse 39. This is when Peter is wrapping up the, the message he gave on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people end up getting saved, and he tells them the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the, the promise is to you, and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. We're about as far off from Jerusalem as you can get. So this promise is for you. As you go through the book of Acts, I love to point out all the times it uses the word filled. Peter was filled, overflowing on the day of Pentecost. He wasn't very filled up, though, in Galatians chapter 2, when Paul calls him a hypocrite to his face. He was quenching and grieving the Spirit because he was acting like a Judaizer, pointing fingers at the Gentiles. Paul says, you're a Jew, you're living like a Gentile, now you're expecting these Gentiles to live like Jews? You're a hypocrite, Peter. You think he was filled overflowing with the Spirit at that moment? No. But then as you go through the book of Acts, it says, then Peter, filled with the Spirit, said this and did that. Then Peter, filled with the Spirit, did these other things. And then it says, Paul, filled the Spirit, did these things. Some of them are miraculous. Some of them, God just gave them wisdom. It tells us that all the disciples were gathered together. The Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them up and gave them boldness to preach the Word. That's what we need today, boldness to preach the Word of God, to share the gospel with those around us. You know, I love what John Corson used to say about so many people get hung up on tongues. You know, tongues, I believe, is still a valid gift, not for everybody, there's groups out there saying, well, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, then if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved, so be careful with that. John Corson used to say, you know what? The body of Christ is like a big locomotive train going down the tracks. Tongues is like the engineer tooting the horn. Doot, 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 doot. 
Yeah, you can sit there in the train station all day long. Doot, 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 doot. Is that delivering any of the goods in that train or needs to go? No. But as you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to deliver the goods, whatever that is, however that looks like. Giving the word of wisdom to somebody, word of knowledge, giving somebody a helping hand, the gift of helps. Giving people encouragement, you know, giving us a, a gift of encouragement. There's a lot of different gifts that he wants us to operate in, in the gift of teaching. But boldness to proclaim God's message to a lost and dying world right now is first and foremost, I think, in all of our lives. So don't just toot the horn, people. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm.